Good evening. Welcome to our evening worship service at Calvin Christian Reformed Church. I'm Pastor Ken Benjamins. A reminder of how our service goes. After the opening hymn, you'll see a slide. You'll be invited to pause your video then in order to do the things on that slide. We read Psalm 138. We offer individual and or personal prayer. We give our offering for Redeemer University. Do pray for that institution as well. And then once complete, uh, just hit play again and the video will continue. Our call to worship for tonight is from Psalm 99, verses 1 to 3. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name, he is holy. Let's come to our God in a word of prayer. Merciful Father, you are sovereign and mighty and holy, and you are kind. We thank you for your care for the church in these last days, in these days of trials and tribulations and pandemics. You seal the church, you feed the church, and so we praise you and we proclaim your name. Bless us to that end by the power of your Holy Spirit, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregation, we together confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Receive the Lord's greeting from Revelation chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Opening hymn of praise is How Lovely Is Your Dwelling. Take from Psalter Hymnal number 243. This is Psalm 84, verses 1 to 7. Put to music. Let's sing the three stanzas.
Scripture reading for tonight is from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. There we read, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our text speaks of a woman giving birth to a baby. Sounds a little like Christmas, maybe? If you think so, you'd be right. Our text speaks of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Many preachers have preached on this text at Christmas time. Makes total sense. This text is very fitting. Our text is about Christmas, but it's also about the ascension. Verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Snatched up. That event refers to the ascension, when Christ rode the clouds up into heaven to wear heaven's crown. My sermon for today is entitled, Christmas and the Crown. Allow me some introduction first. Congregation, we are now entering the third picture of world history. If you recall, Revelation chapter 6 to 22 has these seven pictures of world history. They all run parallel, if you remember. Yeah, we looked at the first two pictures uh, so far. Today we're going to, be to, we're going to begin to look at the third picture. This third picture is somewhat like the first two pictures. What's similar about them? Well, uh, all three pictures are divided into seven smaller units. The first picture has seven seals. The second picture has seven trumpets. Now, although the third picture has no unifying theme like seals or trumpets, it is nonetheless divided into seven smaller units. So there are seven here, there are seven here, there are seven here as well. And so they all run parallel. They all cover world history in one way, shape, or form. This third picture is no exception. It begins in the Old Testament right from the beginning, really, leads up to the birth of Christ and his ascension, and it continues on right to the very end. Congregation, as we move along through these different pictures of world history, you'll notice a certain progression. In the first two pictures, we catch a glimpse of what happens on the earth, especially, as we wait for the day of Christ's return, the end. The focus is on the earth, what, what we experience in our lives among all the judgments and all the tribulations. In this third picture now, we begin to see more what happens behind the scene, underneath the surface, so to speak. Sure, in this picture, we meet the main characters. We meet Satan. We meet Christ. And we see the church's role in the midst of the battle between these two characters. We begin to see what's really going on. Everything comes to a critical point, of course, in the birth and in the ascension of Jesus Christ. Thus, my sermon title for today, Christmas and the Crown. Let's look at the details of our passage. Revelation 12, verse 1. John writes, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, 
a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Quite the woman we have here. She's obviously very majestic. Yeah, if the sun, the moon, and the stars are great and majestic, this woman is even more majestic. She wears the sun, the moon, and the stars. But she's vulnerable. Verse 2, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So what do we have here? We have a great majestic woman who's in labor, about to give birth. Verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. He swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Okay, what do we have here? We have a dragon. He, he's ugly. He's red, the color of blood, war, and destruction in Revelation. He's got seven heads and ten horns. He's a mean-looking beast. And he's huge and powerful. He can knock out a third of the stars in heaven with his tail, no less. Let's identify who we, what we have here so far. Then, who are these? Who are these creatures? Who's the dragon? First of all, uh, he's Satan. We know that for sure because verse nine, a few verses later, says so. And the woman, uh, who is she? You might say that she would be Mary. Well, good guess, but no. She, this woman, is the people of God. She's the Old Testament church. Yep, she's dressed in the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's reminiscent of Joseph's dream in Genesis chapter 37. Remember how Joseph said the sun, moon, and the stars would bow down to him? Yeah, who were the sun, the moon, and the stars? That was Joseph's family. Thus, the covenant people of God, the church of the Old Testament. And so in our text, the people of God, the church, God's bride, beautifully dressed in all of her splendor, is pregnant. And in her bosom is the Christ. In the Old Testament, the people of God were in labor. They were in pain as they longed for the birth of the Christ. We note the interplay between the dragon and the woman now. What happens? According to our text, the dragon watches the woman. He watches her every move. You know why? He wants her baby. He wants to devour and destroy that baby. Congregation, isn't that exactly what Advent, what Old Testament history is all about? It's about Satan's hope, Satan's plan to attack the Christ child in the womb of the people of God. That's why Satan always went after the seed of the woman. That's why baby boys were thrown into the Nile in Egypt, remember? That's why baby children were slaughtered in the streets in the time of the exile. That's why baby boys were killed in Bethlehem by Herod's sword soon after Jesus was born. Satan is out to devour the Christ child. <clears throat> why is Satan after him? Why? Because Satan is deathly afraid of him. <clears throat> Remember God's promise to the serpent in Genesis 3, verse 15? <clears throat> right after the fall, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head. You caught that. God said that the seed of the woman, the Christ child in her womb, would come and crush the dragon's head. And so Satan is afraid. He wants to watch the woman in labor. When she moves, he moves. When she cries, he looks even more intently. His goal is to crush the Christ child before the Christ child will crush him. But it is not to be. In verse 5, we read that the child is born. The woman gives birth. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Hallelujah. He is born, and as soon as John reports this, we read that Christ is snatched up to God and to his throne. 
Now, to us, this may sound a little fast. I mean, is there nothing more to say about his coming? What about all those things that happened between Christmas and the day he was snatched up to heaven? What about Jesus' earthly ministry? What about his teaching? What about his passion? What about his death and his resurrection? Are these things not important to John? Of course they are. But they are not essential to the point that John wants to make here. Christ is born. Why? Ultimately? so that he might reign. We see this in other places in Scripture, too. I think of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You know the passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Yep, it's Christmas for the purpose of the crown. Even the Magi understood this. That's why they came from the east to seek him out. Matthew 2, verse 2. Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Yep, as it is, according to our text, Jesus was born, and after winning our salvation, he was snatched up to God, and there he reigns. He still reigns. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Satan, of course, shrieks at the sound of this. You know, back in the Old Testament, he patiently waited for the arrival of the Christ. Oh, how he wanted to get him. But it was to no avail. Christ is finally born, but Satan cannot get him, cannot stop him. He gets nowhere until until he manages to get Pontius Pilate to nail Jesus to the cross. He must have thought, aha, now I've got him. But what did Jesus say right before he died? He said, it is finished, signifying that Christ had just demolished him. Lord's Day 1, right? He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. Christ is born, he has won the victory, and so he has snatched it to God and to his throne. It's Christmas and the crown. Hallelujah. And the woman? What has become of her in all of this? What has happened to her? John addresses that in verse 6. Starting in verse 5, John writes, She gave birth to a son a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Congregation, you understand that our text is talking about our situation now. He's talking about the church after Christ has been snatched up to heaven. Where are we now? Where is the woman now that Christ has ascended? She has fled, says John. Which makes sense. I mean, the dragon really hates the woman now. She has given birth to the Christ child, and now she actually worships the Christ child. The woman celebrates that Jesus is king over all, and so the dragon will do anything to get at her. But it cannot be done. Why? Because the woman has fled into the desert. Congregation, the desert carries a lot of Old Testament significance. Remember where Israel went after they were liberated from Egypt, they went into the desert. That was the place they went before they entered the Promised Land. The desert is a very unique place. On the one hand, it is a scary place. It's dry, it's dusty, snakes and scorpions live there. But on the other hand, the desert is the place where God especially takes care of his people. It was in the desert that God fed his people water, manna, 
and quail. Verse 6 says, The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God. There you go. The woman is in a place where God takes care of her. The woman has fled to his hiding place, his refuge. The Greek word used here is topos. In other co uh, contexts, topos is often translated as sanctuary. In his sanctuary, God cares for the woman. He protects her from the dragon. And for how long? says verse 6, the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Congregation, what's with that number? What's with that number? Very good. First of all, 1,260 days is not to be taken literally. If we take it literally, then that time period has come and gone a long time ago. The number is a symbolic number, as are most numbers in Revelation. What does this number refer to? This number refers to the period between Christ, when Christ ascended up into heaven and the very end when he will return again. It's the period of the tribulations, when God especially sends judgments upon the earth. You know, God sends his judgment throughout all of history, but now that Christ is on the throne, God especially sends them now. The more people refuse to repent and believe and acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ, the more he sends his judgments. And so that's what this time period refers to. It's a time between when Christ goes up and when Christ comes down at the end of history. Now, why the number 1,260 days then? It's noteworthy that 1,260 days is the same period as 42 months. And 42 months is the same period as three and a half years. All three numbers equal the same length of time. It's noteworthy as well that in Scripture, these numbers, th this time period, consistently refers to those periods of time in history when God's people endure hardship, tribulations, and desert wanderings. Consider this. According to Numbers, according to Numbers chapter 33, Israel's desert wandering consists of 42 stages, which corresponds with the drought in Elijah's time, which lasted three and a half years, which corresponds as well with the three and a half years of tribulation spoken of in Daniel 7, Daniel 9, and Daniel 12. According to the Maccabees, the book of Maccabees, the reign of Antiochus uh, Epiphanes was also three and a half years. You follow. Three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, these numbers carry symbolic value. They refer to those periods when God sends judgments upon sin, when God's people are in the desert, and when Satan works hard to devour the church. But, congregation, will Satan ever succeed in devouring the church? The answer is a clear no. And why not? Because in the desert, amidst all the tribulations and all the judgments, God always takes care of his people. They're in his sanctuary. They're safe. And so, they are blessed. So, just to summarize now, in conclusion, congregation, what is our passage about then? Let's put it all together. This third picture, yes, this third picture, like the other two, is a picture of world history. According to this third picture in the Old Testament, Satan was always out to devour the seed of the woman. What is the history of the Old Testament but that struggle? In the fullness of time, the Christ was born. 
He was born in order to crush the serpent's head and to be the king over all. Christmas leads to the crown. Today, Christ is on the throne. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He rules over all, which makes the dragon especially anxious and worried and mad today. Since he can't crush and devour Christ anymore, he will go after the church instead. He'll go after you. But if we know Christ intimately in our hearts by grace through faith, if we commit ourselves to him, we have nothing to fear. Oh, oh Satan will try to devour and God will send his judgments as well. No doubt it's, it's like we are in the desert, but it's in the desert that God always cares for his people. In the desert, we are sealed. Remember picture number one? In, in the desert, we are fed by his word and his sacrament. We devour the word of God. Remember that second picture? In the desert, we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ himself. Today, God's people are in his sanctuary. We are in his tabernacle. The fiery pillar of the Holy Spirit abides in us as well. And so we have nothing to fear. Christ was born, and now he wears the crown. And soon, 1,260 days will be over. Christ will come again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word of Scripture. We are introduced to the main characters. We are introduced to the serpent. And we are introduced to Christ, who was born, born to wear a crown. We thank you that he reigns in heaven above. We thank you, dear gracious God, that even though we may be in the desert and we experience many, many judgments and tribulations, we are still nonetheless in your sanctuary. You seal us, you feed us, and so we preach and we see your lordship and we proclaim it. Gracious God, as we live in these trying days, give us faith, encourage our hope, give us a love for you and for our neighbor. Hear our prayer, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a Christmas carol, Angels from the Realms of Glory, hymn number 354.
let's confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of, of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lift up your hearts to the Lord and receive the Lord's parting blessing by grace through faith. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you all. Amen. And then our closing doxology, praise God, you angel hosts above. From Psalter hymnal uh, number 628, we'll sing the two stanzas.